okay? Yeah. So um, sometimes when I sit here, I am reminded of Reverend Kim uh, Yam Tawanim, who was a director here years ago. And um, she would sit in the seat and she would, every time, right? <laughs> every time she would look out at us and she'd say, you're all Buddhas. And so I think when I look out at all of you, it's, it's such a beautiful view. And I remember that we could see ourselves through her eyes and her sincerity. So I'm really grateful to be here in your presence today. So this is sort of my first Dharma talk as a lay minister. And many people in the community have asked me questions about that. How was the ordination? How do you feel? Um, do you feel more enlightened, which is my favorite question. <laughs> so, but honestly, I will tell you that I feel a little extra pressure today. <laughs> So, but I don't want to, I actually don't want to bypass this feeling of uh, feeling extra pressure because I want to remember it um, for the future and in all the times that I give a talk because I want to remember the, you know, the reverence and the humility of every time I get to sit here and share with you. And I also want to remember the vow that I, I took, I take every day and hopefully when I remember in every minute of every moment. So um, <clears throat> the other thing is that I honestly was told before I came to Wan Buddhism that my whole life, that as a woman, this would be impossible. That as a woman, I could never teach in a religion and I could not be a priest. And it really didn't matter what religion I went to, they all said the same thing. Um, so I think I became attached to that view. So on the day of ordination, that identification was sort of in my mind. And I was also recovering from sickness. I was up all night with my kids who were sick. My husband was sick and there was a snowstorm. I had to shovel myself out. So I'm kind of like, did I anger the gods? <laughs> like, that was my thought. So I really had that in my head. So I got, but I'm really stubborn. So I got in the car anyway and drove here anyway through the snow. There wasn't even a road. It was just snow. So driving through the snow, but I was like gripping the wheel, <laughs> waiting and like looking around for the lightning bolt. Like what's going to be the thing that's going to stop this from happening? And I caught my mind really starting to worry, going over and over and over again with this kind of worry. And then I started to ruminate, like, oh, it's been so long. This has been such a long journey. <laughs> it's been such a hard, long journey. And this went on and on for a while. And then something, oh, something really simple and extraordinary happened, which is I saw, I will cry. <laughs> I saw Myung Tawanim's face in my mind. And it changed my thought um, because I remembered her Dharma talk and how she carried the freezing cold water up and down the, the mountain or hill. It was probably a mountain, I'll say a hill, but it's probably a mountain. And I remembered um, my Wan Buddhism history teacher, Reverend Sung Jun, talk about all of the women ministers that started this in equal, in equal measure to their male counterparts and all of the sacrifice they made at a time of deep uh, oppression. So how brave they were to make this and that they were responsible for me being here today. So my little bit of um, angst wasn't all that great. <clears throat> so I felt in that moment uh, you know, such gratitude to the mothers, these mothers of our world, many of whom are in this room today. So as a little girl, I did not have religion in my home, but what I did have 
is a mother who covered the house in saints. If there was an empty spot on a table, my mom put a saint there. So, and, and funnily enough, my brother was so clumsy that he would knock, in, inevitably he would knock into like a table or a, or a cabinet. And every time he'd break the heads off the saints. So my backdrop, my landscape was all of these little saints that are glued on heads. It's really funny, but I, it was pretty normal. It was very normal to me to have all these little, little people, this little army. <laughs> so all of them had glued on heads except one. And it was a statue of Mary. And my mom would put it high up in the corner. I think she just didn't want the head to get knocked off. But she put it high up in the corner and she lit a candle every single night for as long as I can remember. And every night she said the same thing. She said, this is for my children. So light a candle every night for my children. And at some point, um, I think I must have followed her example because around seven, I started to sneak out of my room in the middle of the night. It was like my secret. And I would sit on the cold tile floor and I would pray to Mary. So please make me like you. Now I want to be a mother of the world like you. So this went on and on and on for, for quite a while until, um, <clears throat> until my mother, I think, got a little worried about me because then I started wearing a blue sheet on my head everywhere I went. <laughs> so I don't blame her. <laughs> um, but she, so she sat me down to tell me about religion. And she told me, the one thing I remember the most that she told me was that women could not be priests and women could not teach. And I really felt like, why? It was so odd. It still feels so odd, that idea. And my wish felt really simple. It didn't feel special, right? as a little girl. So it was like telling a child who wanted to be a chef that no, you can, you can cut the vegetables, but you can never share your recipes with the world. Or a little girl who wanted to paint that it's okay to clean the studio, but the paints are reserved for men because only men can paint. The only question I asked my mother was, is why can't boys and girls do the same jobs? And she said she didn't know why. Neither do I. So throughout the history of Buddhism and Christianity and many other faiths, um, women have been considered inferior. And it's, uh, it's changing slowly. <laughs> but the world suffers as a result. It does. Because if we discard half of us, how can we see the whole of us? And the wisdom of these women have left for us remains locked away. Because I still have a hard time finding any history of enlightened women in the past. With all the information at my disposal, I don't see it. I don't find it. So I'm going to take a moment to share some of the teachings of these women, these women Buddhas. And most of them, or some of them, you may have never heard of, or sadly, you may have heard that they were the antithesis of an enlightened woman. But you get to choose. You get to decide for yourself. So first is Mary Magdalene. And she was considered the closest disciple of Jesus. And she had her own gospel in which she says, attachments to matter give rise to passion against nature. Thus, trouble arises in the whole body. This is why I tell you, be in harmony. If you are out of balance, take inspiration from manifestations of your true nature. She tells us that Jesus spoke of being attached to the material world and that we should come back to our true nature. Return and return again, Namo Amitabha. St. Clair, who was the leader of the San Franciscan Order for the women's side. And she said, I admonish and exhort all my sisters, both those present and those to come, to strive always to imitate the way of holy simplicity, humility, and poverty. 
How many of you know St. Paul? Many people know him. Many people know Corinthians. And they know about his trials. They know love is patient, love is kind. We know that poem, right? But how, but how many people know of Tekla? So Tekla, Tekla was somebody who preached alongside St. Paul, a young woman. But we don't know of her very well. And because she refused marriage to follow God, she was sent to be executed many different ways and many different times, every time surviving. And because of this, she inspired a multitude of women. And lastly, in this, what I'm going to say is a more modern day, which is Dipama. She's the teacher of Joseph Goldstein, Sharon Salzberg, and Jack Kornfield. And she encouraged her students to make every moment count and emphasize bringing mindfulness to cooking, ironing, talking, or any other daily activity. She often said that the whole path of mindfulness is simply awareness of whatever you're doing. Always know what you are doing, she would say. You cannot separate meditation from life. Does that sound familiar? So I really believe that many religious leaders want to give the teachings of their faith. And I, I do think in many ways they are doing their best. We are all trying. We are all in the same boat, right? We're all human. And we all act out of our own understanding. But I also think we need to seriously ask ourselves if someone who exemplifies the truth has discrimination in their, in their hearts and minds. It's like asking if the sun picks and chooses who it will shine upon. So just like the statue that held of Mary who held the light for me in the dark, an enlightened teacher, I believe, is one that embraces all things with unconditional acceptance just as a mother holds a love for her children. So I was coming here to the ordination that day to make a promise, to see if there was any corner of my mind that held doubt. Did I believe wholeheartedly, 100% in this teaching? Could I uphold without reservation or question the words of Master Sotasan? And with my whole heart, I can say, I can, I will, and I promise. And here's why. I have the words of my teacher in, reg in regards to this kind of discrimination and many other things as my guide. I have his words, our Ilwan Buddha, our founding master, Sotasan. And he gave us this beautiful Ilwan song, this circle, this representation of who we are, and he said, that we are perfect and complete, utterly impartial and selfless. Every one of us, everything. So beyond the discernment of our differences and our personalities, we are one. So over a hundred years ago, he said <clears throat> that there's no difference between male and female. Our true nature is beyond any separation. Our genders do not separate us. Our race, our status, nothing separates us. All aversions or discriminations occur in our mind. It's the result of our ignorance. And to say this is not an admonishment, it's a shared experience. It's human. But our threefold practice that he gave us helps us to relieve our minds of this burden and to wake to our true nature and that then use that nature in every moment of every minute of our lives. So he directs us as an enlightened teacher. And I actually think he asks us whether we are male or female, young or old, learned or not, lay or ordained, and so on. He asks us to understand that we are too precious to allow the obstacles of discrimination and judgment to keep us from the light of who we are. Oh, let me show you this picture. This, this is big enough so you all can see. 
So I want to show you not only his words, but actions. Yeah, she's lovely. This is a very powerful, early Wan Buddhist minister. And her birth name was Cho Oksan. She was one of the first female disciples of Master Sorisan. And like I said, this was over 100 years ago during Japanese occupation and under Confucian rule. And so women had no rights at all. They could not have an education. They could not, they only were to get married and have children and then to serve their fathers, their husbands, and then their sons. So, <clears throat> and they couldn't own property. They couldn't get inheritance, nothing. However, when she went to see Sotasan, she expressed this wish. She said, even though I am a woman and therefore destined to sacrifice myself for family, I wish to become a great person who can do something great for the world. So Dasan conferred a name, on, gave her a Dharma name, which is Chun Guan. And that means seizing all of the powers and rights. And he further explained why he gave her this name. So he said, please reveal your utmost value and assume all the power in the world by becoming a mother to all sentient beings. In order to become a mother to all sentient beings, you need to be enlightened to the truth of all things in the universe. Only after being enlightened, we'll be able to understand the relationship between you and me and all else and produce infinite compassion. After that, you can serve the whole world through the highest order of compassion, which comes from having no self. So Chun Guan, I was told did seize all the power, and her Dharma talks were incredibly moving, and she could reach the masses. And I probably wouldn't be here today without her, and without the early Kiyomanus. So this talk today isn't about the wrongness of men. Of course not. It's about uncovering the wholeness and the selflessness of who we are. So I'm going to share one last story with you. And Reverend, you told us this story a few days ago. It's a story about Michelangelo. And I was really moved by this story because I'd never heard it. Um, but they had, someone had commissioned Michelangelo to create an angel, to sculpt an angel out of, I don't know, marble maybe, I don't know, stone. And instead of just saying, you know, having an idea or sketching an idea, he went to the lake to sit and practice, or whatever the practice, ruminate, whatever it was, to, to just uh, quiet his mind, I should say. He went to quiet his mind. And then he allowed the quieting of the mind to happen, and then the angel appeared in his mind. And what he said was, is that the angel is already in the stone. All I am doing is freeing the angel by cutting away what's not necessary. And I think that that's what we are doing as well. Little by little, cutting away. So we realize what Reverend Kim Yantawanim told us. We realize as we cut away our discrimination and our judgments and realize our own selflessness and see with, with the realm of universal truth that we are Buddha. Thank you for listening today. <laughs>